Good evening. This past summer, I attended a family reunion for my mother's side in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Over a hundred relatives were present. It's an odd bunch of people. Farmers, lawyers, hairstylists, personal trainers, college professors, you name it. There's no logical way to follow most of the conversation that takes place, but my Aunt Dot, she has one rule of thumb. To avoid an undesirable controversy, steer clear of politics and religion, and just stick to topics like the weather. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to inform you that this evening we have refused Aunt Dot's advice. I assume no one entered this auditorium for a safe conversation, so there will be little disappointment when I tell you the debate this evening has nothing to do with the weather and very much to do with politics and religion. Taking into consideration Mr. Hitchens and Mr. D'Souza's past two debates, I have no doubt that it will be both spirited and perhaps even controversial. I'm Kylie Humphreys, the student body president of the King's College, the hosting institution of tonight's events. And I've been asked to introduce this evening's debate, co-sponsored by the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and to the source.org. The vision of the King's College is distinctive. So, so much so, the King's is something of a mystery to many outsiders who observe. The New Yorker remarked that the college was a curious addition to the Empire State Building's giant roster of mis misfit tenants. The National Review Online noted King's as a fascinating experiment in higher education. And the Village Voice even questioned what a Christian college's purpose might be in New York City. In practice, King seeks to educate, equip, and inspire high-quality students to engage the national dialogue with courage and ambition. It wants to produce a persuasive voice in a society where the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. By teaching students how to think clearly and deeply in the intellectually vibrant city of New York, the college hopes to see its students enter the public square in defense of truth. The college is grateful for two other sponsoring organizations which have made tonight's event possible. The first is the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. As part of their Cicero's Podium, a debate series focused on great ideas, ISI aims to elevate civil discussion promote genuine intellectual diversity, and encourage thoughtful citizens to think about the books and ideas that have shaped our experience in ordered liberty. For more information on Cicero's Podium or ISI, visit isi.org or their table located in the lobby. We'd also like to thank tothesource.org for their generous support of tonight's debate. To the Source is a forum which seeks to integrate thought and action from a Judeo-Christian framework through weekly email reports from influential critical cultures. To the Source addresses specific, timely issues that challenge hardcore secularism with principled pluralism. From its inaugural broadcast of 100 people to today's nearly 30,000 subscribers, To the Source continues to offer insightful commentary to embolden men and women of faith for greater civic involvement. As you entered this evening, you should have received a small brochure about the King's College. Inside, you'll find some information about To The Source, should you like to subscribe to their free newsletter. There's also a comment card that gives you the opportunity to let the college know if you'd like to know more about future events, the college, or perhaps even visit our campus in the Empire State Building. And finally, allow me to introduce Dr. Marvin Alasky, who will serve as the moderator for this evening's debate. Dr. Alasky is the provost of the King's College and editor-in-chief of World Magazine, the fifth most read news weekly in the United States. Dr. Alasky comes to this stage respected for his insight into the spheres of journalism and academia, as well as his engagement in the topics of religion and politics he himself having sat opposite Mr. Hitchens this past May when they debated the topic, is Christianity good for the world? Perhaps we can ask Dr. Alasky after tonight's debate whether he prefers debating or moderating. Please welcome Dr. Marvin Alasky. Well, thank you, Kylie. All of us are here because our debaters need very little in the way of introduction. Christopher Hitchens is a columnist for Vanity Fair. 
and the author of many books, including God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. In a review of that book, Richard Dawkins praised the deadly accuracy of Hitchens critique and offered this advice. If you are invited to debate with Christopher Hitchens, decline. <laughs> Relax. Relax. Now, Dinesh D'Souza, who has not declined, has written influential books such as The End of Racism and The Virtue of Prosperity. One reviewer said this about Dinesh's new book, quote, infinitely more sophisticated than the rants produced by Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> What's so great about Christianity leaves those atheist books in the dust? Well, we shall see. Ground rules for tonight. Dinesh goes first for 10 minutes, then Christopher has 10 minutes. Each has a five minute rebuttal, and then we let them go at each other directly for 15 minutes. We'll then entertain questions from the audience, not speeches or homilies, questions please, with King's College students getting the first three questions. Uh, Dinesh, Christopher, please pay attention to the timekeeper who has signs indicating a two-minute warning and then a stop sign. So let's begin. Dinesh, you're up first. Henry VIII used with one of his wives, he said, I won't keep you very long. <laughs> I, um, this, is, uh, this is Christopher Hitchens in my third time around. We've debated other topics before. It's our first time debating this issue. I really welcome the opportunity. In my opening statement, I'm going to make a positive statement about Christianity. In my rebuttal, I will correct the mistakes of Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> now, we're living in a very unusual time in which atheism has emerged as a kind of militant phenomenon. Uh, and in the face of that, that's a little bit odd. Because if you are an unbeliever, why be militant? Uh, I don't believe in unicorns but I haven't written, written any books on the subject. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time denouncing unicorns. I live my life as if unicorns did not exist. But what we have from the atheist side is a, is a belligerent attack on theism and specifically on Christianity. I want to try to answer this attack by using the same tools of reason and skepticism and science and evidence that is the banner under which the atheists march. In no way this evening will I rely on scripture or any kind of theology to make my points. So I'm going to focus entirely on reason and evidence. Let me begin, if I may, this way. In reading through the various atheist books by Hitchens, Dawkins, Harris, and the others, if I were to make a list of the, the values that the atheists cherish the most. I would list values like the idea of individual dissent, the notion of personal dignity, the idea of equality, the equal dignity of men and women, uh, a, an antipathy to oppression, inequality, and slavery, the idea of compassion as a social virtue, now, what's interesting is that if you take a good look at this list, you realize that these values came into the world because of Christianity. How do we know that? Partly by looking outside of Western civilization, where we see that these things that we take for granted, 
There's a tsunami that devastates a part, a place in Africa. All the Western, which is to say Christian nations, rush to help. Nobody else seems to. Something unique is going on that's internal to our civilization. Now you might say, well, Western civilization isn't just built on Christianity, it's built on Athens, by which we can say classical reason, and also on Jerusalem, which is Judaism and Christianity. And yet if you look at the world of Athens, which is to say Greece and then pre-Christian Rome, you discover that those were civilizations that were based on slavery. They were civilizations where women were treated very badly. They were civilizations where human life didn't count for a whole lot. The Spartans notoriously would leave the feeble child on the hillside to see if it was still alive in the morning. And the great philosophers of Greece and Rome viewed these incidents with equanimity. They didn't think it was a big deal. It is only from Christianity that these things that had been uncontroversial for a long time become controversial for the first time. In Sam Harris's book, he tries to blame slavery on Christianity. But the reality is that if you look at history, slavery was a universal institution practiced in every known culture. The Greeks and Romans had it. The Chinese had it. There was slavery in ancient India. American Indians had slavery long before Columbus got here. So it is Christianity that mobilized the first movement in the world to oppose slavery. First the Quakers and then the evangelical Christians took a theological idea that we are all equal in the eyes of God. An idea that, by the way, for some centuries was seen as a merely uh, spiritual truth and they gave it a political application. If we are all created equal in the eyes of God, no man has the right to rule another man without his consent. This idea became the moral engine of the anti-slavery movement both in Europe and in America. And this concept is not only the moral root of anti-slavery, it is also the basis of democracy. What's the premise of representative democracy? No man has the right to rule another without consent. And I want to turn for a moment to science because one of the rallying cries of modern atheism is the supposed incompatibility between Christianity and science. An incompatibility rendered puzzling at the outset because if you make a list of the leading scientists of the West in the past 500 years, you find that the vast majority of them were not only theist, but specifically and devoutly Christian. This was true of Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, Bry, Priestley, Lavoisier. You can just go down the list all the way through Gassendi, Mersenne, Mendel. Some of these guys were monks, like Mendel, Gassendi, and Mersenne were priests. So right away you have a puzzle. We have literary theorist Christopher Hitchens and biology major Sam Harris positing a supposed conflict that was not evident to the great scientists of the West stretching from Kepler to Newton. I want to make perhaps a further point about this though. Not only were these scientists Christian, not only did they see their work as revealing the divine handiwork in the universe, but I want to argue that modern science itself is based on three Christian assumptions that are at root metaphysical. Assumption number one, the universe as a whole is rational. The universe embodies rationality. Now if you think about it, that's odd. It's pretty easy to say that my friend Bill is rational or Christopher Hitchens is partially rational. <laughs> it's another thing to say that matter and objects and planets embody a certain kind of rationale. They follow rational principles. Number two, the universe obeys laws that are comprehensible in the language of mathematics. Again, if you think about it, that's very strange. If I'm driving my car, I can follow laws. I see a stop sign, I come to a halt. How does matter obey laws. How does the electron know what to do? If we look at matter, it is unbelievably well behaved. 
It follows the laws of Newton's inverse square law. It obeys Einstein's laws. The point I'm trying to get at here is that this is a metaphysical proposition. A third one, the laws out there in nature are mirrored by the goings on within our minds. We can apprehend and understand the laws. Very odd. Why should the goings on within our head match the goings on in the universe? Now, if you're a believer, you know why. God is believed to be omniscient, which is to say super rational. He built the universe to embody rationality. God is a lawgiver, and the universe reflects his laws. We are made in God's image. We have a spark of the divine. So it's not surprising to the theist that you have this arrangement. But for the atheist, you can't take any of that for granted. This is faith-based science. A final point. We hear a great deal about how Christianity has been terrible for the world. The truth of it is, if you look at the casualties of Christianity, the Inquisition, the Crusades, the Salem Witch Trials, I read a book on the Salem Witch Trials, I had been educated to believe the Salem Witch Trials had killed thousands or at the very least hundreds of people. I discovered that at the Salem Witch Trials, the number of people executed was in fact 18. The Inquisition, if you read Henry Kamen's book, the most authoritative study of the Inquisition, the Spanish Inquisition, over 300 years, killed 2,000 people. Now just try to compare that to the crimes inflicted by atheist regimes, not 500, not 1,000 years ago, but within our lifetime. If you look only at the big three, Stalin's Russia, Mao's China, the Nazi regime in Germany, you have, within the space of five decades, over a hundred million casualties. So atheism, not religion, is responsible for the mass murders of history. I want to end by saying that I think Christianity has done a lot for the world. The world would be a lot worse if we didn't have it. I think even Christopher Hitchens, by the end of today, should be chanting, if only under his breath, thank God for Christianity. Well now, uh, Mr. Chen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, comrades, friends, brothers, sisters, I would be self-sacrificially a Christian if I cut into my own time, limited as it is, to pay any compliments, so I won't, except to say <laughs> that Dinesh is one of the most formidable debaters I've ever encountered on any subject, that he has the further great advantage of actually believing in this stuff, you wouldn't, you, you, you try it. You go up and down the country, ask a Calvinist, uh, does he really believe in Calvin's theory of predestination? Ask a Roman Catholic, do they really believe in the virgin birth? You get all kinds of life of Brian evasions from them. It's, it's metaphorical, really. No, Dinesh believes this. That's very useful. And then I want to thank the um, alarmingly polite and wholesome uh, faculty and staff of the King's College. Um, now, I'm asked to prove that Christianity is the problem, and I'll try to do that, but I, for now, all you need to think, I think I need to say is it's a problem or part of the problem, being as it is what we know it to be, a loose plagiarism from Judaism, and along with Judaism, one of the other two religions plagiarized in turn, that's given us all the blessings of Islam. So it's part of man-made religiosity uh, that goes under the trades, under the brand name of monotheism, and the problem that all three have in common is that of faith. Faith, in other words, that a man-made religion can actually keep a promise of salvation, not just in this life and the next. Dinesh, you'll notice, was, was careful to say, well, certain social ameliorations can be written down to Christianity. He didn't claim that it was a salvation in this life or the next, just that it, some of its adherents have occasionally taken liberal stances. Well, I think he'll find he has a higher standard of proof in front of an audience like this. That's the first belief that faith involves. And second, the belief that faith is in itself a virtue, transcending reason and dispensing, uh, conveniently enough, with the need for evidence. 
Now, it's my proposition straight out and uh, straightforwardly that what we think of as our morality, as our ethics, comes from human solidarity and predates all forms of monotheism. Don't let it be said in your hearing, ladies and gentlemen, any of you who have any self-respect, that um, though I, we know the story to be fiction of the Exodus and the wandering and the encounter in Sinai, we know that really to be a metaphor, but taking it to be true that my mother's ancestors wandered all that time under the belief that uh, perjury and murder and theft were okay, only to eventually bump into my, Mount Sinai and receive the news it wasn't kosher after all. <laughs> we have to have more respect for ourselves than that. Any human society that had believed those things wouldn't have got that far. I think it's pretty safe to say. Christianity, in other words, is masochistic as well as partly sadistic. It attacks us in our deepest integrity. It says that you and I wouldn't know a right action, wouldn't be able to derive it, or a right thought, a right thought without the permission of a celestial dictatorship that guards us while we sleep, that can convict us of thought crime, that supervises our every waking moment, that is in fact the origin of totalitarianism in the, in the obeisances that it demands of us, and that will continue to judge us and persecute us and supervise us even after we were dead. This in my view, as well as being utterly untrue, uh, utterly falsified by fearful human beings, uh, is something that it is very fortunate we possess no evidence for. How horrible it would be if we were condemned to live in this posture of gratitude, permanent gratitude, to an unalterable dictatorship in whose installation we had had no say. And let me add, the worst of that would be if that dictatorship was benign. That would be the thing that would make it insufferable. Some of us refuse it, and we do so on what we confidently say are moral grounds, as well as the ground that the story is a fairy tale made up by fallible and opportunistic human beings. Why else would I say, in the time I've got left, that um, Christianity is, as well as untrue, immoral? Well, it offers something horrible, vicarious redemption. You're told that by applauding a human sacrifice, a, a, a particularly cruel and revolting one, that took place before you were born to fulfill a prophecy in which you had no say, uh, condemns you either to punishment and sin if you don't accept it or if you do accept it offers you the chance that your own sins can be forgiven you. Well everything is wrong with this picture. First, as with the original proposition of a, de of a deity, it, it, it requires of you compulsory love as well as compulsory fear. You have to simultaneously love someone, you're commanded to love them and be frightened of them at the same time. This is no way to teach morals. Second, you're told not that you might get a second chance, but the, or, or that yours, your debts can be paid. I can pay your debts if I care enough for you. I could serve your time in prison if I wished. But I can't forgive you the sin. I can't absolve you of the responsibility for what you've already done. I can't wash you white as snow. And the desire to be washed in that way and to be free of responsibility is itself an immoral one and should be rejected by anyone with any, I'll repeat the term, with any self-respect. So the vicarious redemption by human sacrifice is an immoral preachment with very immoral implications, as is compulsory love coupled with compulsory fear. The idea that the, that the laws of nature can be suspended in your favor if you make the right propitiations is a lie. Dinesh points out what a lie it is. Einstein says how marvelous it is. The great thing about the universe is its laws never are suspended. They are never suspended. They do operate according to a beauty, a logic, and a symmetry that we don't quite yet understand. We're getting to understand them better. Dinesh points it out rather intelligently to you. What does Christianity say? Ah, those laws can be suspended, and in your favor too, if you make the right prayers and propitiations and sacrifices. There can be a virgin can conceive, a dead body, can walk again, your leprosy can be cured, the blind can see. Nonsense! It's not moral to lie to children. It's not moral to lie to ignorant, uneducated people and to tell them that if they will only believe nonsense, they can be saved. It's immoral. The totalitarian concept of the afterlife, the idea, the hideous idea, doesn't even occur in the New Testament. Excuse me, 
doesn't occur in the, even in the violent, rape and genocide filled books of the Jewish Bible. Uh, there is no punishment of the dead. When God has destroyed your tribe and had your virgins and your children uh, murdered in front of you and your flocks and herds scattered and so on, and you also fall down to a bronze sword, uh, he's done with you. The earth can close over you. That's it. You've tangled with the wrong tribe, the one he favored. Not until gentle Jesus, meek and mild, are you told, if you don't make the right propitiations, you can depart into everlasting fire. That one of the most wicked ideas ever preached, and one that's ruined the lives and the, and the peace of mind of many, many children, preached to them by vicious, child-hating old men and women in the name of this ghastly cult, which we've met here to discuss tonight. You, I don't need two minutes to finish with this religion, but thanks. Um, I have a moral challenge on this point. Answer me this if you think that morality comes from the supernatural and we require celestial dictatorship permission for it. N name me a moral action committed by a believer or a moral statement or ethical statement uttered by one that could not be made or uttered by an unbeliever. I've asked this in a number of venues and forums now. I'm going to keep on asking it. I've not yet had an answer. If I was to ask anyone in this room, however, could they name a wicked action performed or a vile statement made by someone attributable only to their religious faith, there isn't a single person here who would have to hesitate for a second in discovering what that was and saying it. Why is it incompatible with knowledge and science? It's for this reason. We calculate that the human species, Homo sapiens, has been around now Carl Sagan thought perhaps 200,000 years, I would say 100,000. Not, not more, not less. In order to believe the Christian message, you have to believe this. For those 100,000 years, people were born, died, usually many of them in childbirth, uh, either the mother or the child. At life expectancy, perhaps 20 years, 25. Uh, died of microorganisms they didn't know existed. Genesis doesn't mention them because the people who write Genesis don't know there are microorganisms. Earthquakes would have been terrifying. Tsunamis, volcanoes, mysterious events. Uh, war and famine superimposed on this. You can all fill out this picture for yourselves, I'm sure. That was our life for tens of thousands of years. On and on it went. Maybe a gradual upward curve of a sort. We seem to have made some progress very painfully and with infinite suffering and labor and with our solidarity still intact. Now here's what you have to believe you have to believe that heaven watched that for 98,000 years. And after 98,000 years decided, 2,000 years, it may be time to intervene. And the best way of doing that would be to have a filthy human sacrifice in a, in a very remote part of Palestine. And the news of this has still not penetrated to the rest of the world, and I don't think will be believed when it does, and isn't believed by me, and can't be believed by a thinking person. Thank you. Somewhat like the uh, mosquito in the nudist colony, I'm trying to decide where to begin. Um, <laughs> the I want to begin with, um, I want to begin, if I may, with uh, stripping away a kind of a pose. Because usually when you debate the atheist, the pose is, I am a man of evidence seeking the data. I'm following the evidence where it leads. Now, what's interesting is that if you listen to Christopher Hitchens, he offered no shred of evidence for anything he said at all. He presumed, he presumed, he presumed that God does not exist. He presumed the Christians made it all up. He presumed Let's take one of his seemingly firmer presumptions. Scientific laws are inviolable. I said earlier this was an article of faith, and it is. There is no scientific law at all for which we could say that there are no exceptions to it. Let's take one of the most fundamental principles of science. Light travels in a vacuum at the speed of 186,000 miles a second. How do we know that? We've measured it. One time, two times, ten times, a million times. 
The philosopher David Hume says even if you measure it 50 million times, you cannot draw an unrestricted general conclusion from any amount of empirical tests. And why? How do we know that on a distant star 5 million light years away, light travels at that speed? Do we know? We do not know. We guess. We assume. Science is based on those kinds of assumptions. So it is the skeptic David Hume who destroyed this idea that scientific laws admit of no exceptions. And if scientific laws do admit of the possibility of exceptions, miracles are possible. Now, let's look at Christopher's portrait of Christianity, which is the heart of his case. It's not fundamentally about, I think, evidence. It's fundamentally somewhere, I believe, Christopher called himself, and not an atheist, an anti-theist. And I think what he meant by this is, it's not that I don't believe, I hate God. I hate Christianity and I hate its founder, Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Now, if you look at history, not even as a believer, here is Christ, one of the mildest men to set face on the earth. Harmed absolutely nobody. Introduced radical new principles which, if followed, would make our world immeasurably better. Don't just return an eye for an eye. Forgive your enemies. Turn the other cheek. As a council of personal decency and holiness, the power of forgiveness, these are the radical new ideas introduced by Christ. They are seen by Christopher as wicked ideas, even though they have done so much to make our world what it is. It's sadomasochistic, he says. Well, if you look at it purely from human terms, here's a guy, he was killed brutally, but if you accept the Christian premise that God said his son, not just to be killed, but to be resurrected. It's the resurrection that's the core of Christianity, not the crucifixion. So it's not a sadomasochistic thing. It is a triumphant thing. And here I want to get to the core of all this. I want to read a quotation, if I may, from Christopher. And it's something he sort of said this evening. He says, it would be horrible if it were true that we were designed and then created and then continually supervised throughout all our lives, waking and sleeping, it would be like living in celestial North Korea. <laughs> Here I think we get an insight not only into the motive, an insight not only into the motive of atheism, but also into the nature of God himself. And here's what I mean. The way the atheists portray it, God is meanly flinging the atheist into hell. Wrong. We hear from Christopher Hitchens, he doesn't want God. He's shutting himself out from God. He doesn't want heaven. He sees it as a form of abasement, a form of humiliation, a kind of uh, unending parade with flowers in which he's going to be handing out garlands. He doesn't want it. In short, the gates of hell are locked from the inside. When the Bible says that the salvation is a gift of God, many people think it means that God gives you the gift of salvation. No. That's not what it says. It doesn't say salvation is the gift from God. It says salvation is the gift of God. God is the gift. And there's no compulsion. We are free to accept him or to reject him. If we reject him, it is by our own choice and God reluctantly gives us our wish. There's no sadomasochism in that. There is only free choice, the choice to reject God. Thank you. <laughs> Well, a slightly low blow to kick off with Ginesh, I must say. You didn't use your time to prove God's existence either. Um, I think, uh, and I think you'd have, you'd have needed more time than I would if that's what we were here to debate. Um, let's, I, I imagine that it was held in common with, between us and this audience that it isn't possible to decide these matters finally, that no one has ever produced an ontological proof of God that is completely satisfying nor a disproof that is completely satisfying. However, the burden surely is a little more heavy on those who say, I know that there is a God, and not only am I a deist, I'm a theist, I know what he wants. In fact, I know who his son is. In fact, I'm on sort of personal terms with the guy in ways that are not evident to you. That demands a slightly higher standard of proof, and to say you didn't come up to that scratch, my dear, I'm sorry, is to say the least of it, okay? Now, 
Why be militant, I was asked. Why do you care? After all, if all this is nonsense, why do I exercise myself about it? Well, I'll give you one example straight off. There is a religion that some of you will have heard of. It has 12 imams, 12 holy men, who all serve God, a one God, an only God. One of these imams has gone missing, but is expected back imminently when he will bring a reign of universal peace and justice. I don't know if uh, any of you paid attention to what I said earlier about the Islamic plagiarism of Christianity, but Shia Islam is essentially a, a parody of the Catholic faith. Um, now, the people who believe in this, uh, you said unicorn, I would say tooth fairy or sinister Santa Claus, um, propose to acquire thermonuclear weapons by illegal means at present and to deploy them against not just Jews and Christians, but atheists, secularists, homosexualists, rapists, adulterers. I think they've only got me three times so far um, in this. Um, and to, to bring about the, that happy thing that all religions secretly want and celebrate, the eschatological end of days. All religions have this common deformity. They want this to be over. They think what we're going through is just a prelude. Our life is a poor and contemptible thing. Bring on the moment when we'll find the ultimate truth and be able to relax in the Savior's arms or in some promise of heaven, uh, as the sort we were offered this evening. I say it, that I, I think it's a contemptible offer and would be contemptible if there was any basis for believing that it was real. Um, I'm not going to duck, in case you think I am, the question of atheists and secular atrocities, but I'm going to leave it to our next segment because it'll take me just a fraction more time and I'd like to do it in such a way as to pin Dinesh somewhat more uh, to, the, to the mat on it. Um, those who, it, it is argued though on this moral point that those who, who, who repudiate God will have no basis for making uh, their own moral decisions or uttering their own ethical conclusions. That without this, that without this anchoring and, and, and uh, overarching belief and protection, we would simply be in a world of nihilistic chaos, choosing here this and here that uh, option for ourselves with, with no, um, no anchorage of decency, no ballast of, uh, of uh, ethics. Well, just consider if you will, because all of you would have heard that argument many times as well as this evening. Consider if you will what the uh, corollary of it is if you look at it the other way. Is there anything that is forbidden to anybody who says they have God on their side? Who says that they have God with them? Is there any evil that they forbid themselves to do? Is there any enslavement or rape or dispossession they haven't committed? Is it not the case, that, I'll just take the other case of the Shia Muslims, whose claim to a god and to his being the spokesman of morality is just as valid as that of any other religion, as far as I can see. Well, they, in their religion, it's forbidden to execute a virgin, whatever crimes she may have committed in Iran. Can't be executed as a virgin. But if sentenced to the death penalty and still a virgin, she can be raped by the, by the Islamic Revolutionary Guards and then executed because she isn't a virgin anymore. A piece of sadistic ingenuity that would not have disgraced uh, Torquemada or the practitioners of the Inquisition and does show, does it not, that not just in the name of religion, but rather I would say more honestly, precisely because of faith and the certainty that it gives of a divine endorsement that things are done and done all the time and threats made that no decent secularist, no, no convinced atheist humanist could countenance for a second. And of course, atheism is no guarantee. An atheist can be a, a nihilist, can be a sadist, can be a fascist, can be a communist. These are, these are sufficient rather than necessary conditions that I'm talking about. But I hope they will, at least to some extent in your minds, ladies and gentlemen, have broken the connection between religion and ethics as demagogically asserted. Thank you. Yes, we'll now move to 15 minutes of cross-examination with Dinesh getting the first question and the debaters going back and forth. Now, if you have a question that you'd like to ask the debaters, you may, in about 10 minutes or so, begin lining up over there. And the, fir the first three questions go to King students, and then we will let the fun begin in general. Dinesh, your question for Christopher.
Could you name um, any scientific law whatsoever for which you have certain knowledge that there are no exceptions? Um, no, I couldn't. I mean, the, thank you. I take, I take, I, I, I made a different assertion. I said that Einstein says the laws of nature are not suspended. That's quite different. You chose to attack a, a position I hadn't actually espoused, and you had said yourself that there is an obedience to law observable. I can quote you. Or but you my point yourself. was that was an article of faith. That that was not a demonstrated proposition. Einstein knew that, and that's why Einstein was a theist. Einstein believed that God represented a great mind that sustained these laws in that way. You're completely wrong twice. Einstein was not a theist. Einstein, Einstein was, was a theist. <laughs> Einstein was very explicitly not a theist. He was a deist. He said he was a, he was a believer in the God of Spinoza, the God that does not intervene in human affairs, that does not answer prayers, that does not take sides in human quarrels, that does not make judgments on human behavior. Well, this that's, Spinoza that's, was that's not... as far from theism as it's possible to get, and you should have got this by now, Dinesh. You really should. Christopher, you are a little bit... <laughs> There's a difference between the deism and Spinozaism, but we'll, I'll come back to that. I want to I wanna turn to something else. You asked for how do we... How can we reasonably think that God exists? Let me ask you this question. Uh, scientists who begin to look at the universe ask themselves this question. Why does the universe have the rules that it does? Um, why does the universe operate according to the particular dials and parameters it has? What if those parameters were a little different? And the scientists who look at that said, if you change these parameters, even an infinitesimal amount, if the gravitational force were slightly different, or the strong nuclear force, or the electroweak force, we would not have this universe, we would not have life, we would not be here having this debate. Now, what is your explanation for how we live in such a fine-tuned universe? It would seem to suggest a fine-tuner or designer. Darwinism is hopeless here because it's not accounting for the universe, only for transitions among life. So what is your yeah. rational theory for why we live in a fine-tuned universe? Right. Well, there's a good reason why no one comes to me for arguments about physics, but so I have to take, but I'm not ducking the question. Just for your notebooks, ladies and gentlemen, there is a, a book by uh, Professor Victor Stenger on this subject. Dinesh deals with it also in his book. It makes the, the bold claim that science actually negates the case of the existence of God. Well, Stenger says further, the laws of physics come out of nothing. Do you than, agree with that? Further than, further than I would have gone, I'm saying I simply I recommend that you read it. Um, a, a chasm of tautology yawns at the feet of all those who go in for this argument. Richard Dawkins actually said to me once, he thought it was the most interesting argument he'd so far heard or encountered in all the, the debates we've all had with the faithful. And it is, because there's something extraordinary about it. It, of course, also appeals to us, because anything that says to us, you know, you might not have been here, but you are, so that must be something majestic, is obviously appealing to us. Uh, it's sometimes known as... Uh, anthropocentric. Look at the, ex look at the consequences. Look at, look at an example in our, just in the suburb of this argument where we happen to live. A tiny solar system on the very, very edge of the known universe with a sun that is going to flare up in a while into a red dwarf, go out having boiled us alive on the only planet in its solar system that can support, or I think ever has supported, anything like life. Of the other planets, most of them are either too, or all of them, I should say, are either much too hot or much too cold. This is just in our hood, on our block, to support life. And that's true also of a, a huge tracts of our own dear planet, which we happen to know, whatever argument we take about it. Um, Christopher, I'm sorry, you're filibustering me a little bit here. Poised on a this is cross-examination. It's poised on a climatic knife edge. So I would say, bear that in mind, and I would add, quite some design, and quite some designer. Well, you said that... No, I thought it was my turn to ask the question. Yeah. Well, actually, I will forego uh, uh, my, my question to you if you'll re-ask your question to me about atheist uh, tyrannies and, and massacres. And I won't take too much time on it. I'd be willing, I have to ask it to myself. I'd be willing to ask you those questions if you, if you, let, me, if you let it go in a cross-examine. Otherwise, I ask a question and you take up all the time. Well, no, that's why I was asking, that's why is, I was asking you if, if that condition would seem fair. 
I mean, I, I must answer the question which you have asked me in one of your contributions. Shall we leave it for a... Let me do it this way. How about if I put the ball in your court, you pose the questions to me on this topic, and we can go back and forth. All right, then. Okay. Okay. On this question, then, of atheists and secular dictatorships um, that I'm only just mentioning, um, has it ever struck you that the, the original totalitarian movement of the 20th century, the one that actually invented the term totalitarianism, popularized it, claimed it for itself, the movement of Mussolini, Franco, Salazar, Nustasha in Croatia, uh, Father Tizo in Slovakia, you'll see where I'm going with this now, was basically only another term for the Catholic right wing. There's nothing secular about fascism. If there had been, the Vatican would not have signed treaties and concordats with all of the movements and governments that fascism created. I don't think I need to waste very much more time on that. There's a big literature on it. The church keeps on apologizing for this, as for its engagements with similar political movements and governments in Latin America uh, after the Second World War, after the main battle against fascism was over. The German version of this is not uh, the same. It's quite clear that Hitler disliked Christianity, though he never repudiated his Catholicism, praised the church in Mein Kampf, asked for his birthday to be celebrated, which it was every year in every Catholic church in Germany by the order of the Vatican. Um, and Christopher, no, this wait, my wait, turn? Well, wait, wait, wait. Just in, in view of this, in view of the fact that not one person, the, according to Paul Johnson, Catholic historian known to you, I, I think has praised your work, um, up to 50% of the Waffen SS were confessing Catholics, none of whom were ever threatened with excommunication for their activities. The only Nazi I know of to be excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church was Joseph Goebbels. And do you want to know why that was? Do you want to guess? He married a Protestant. Magda Goebbels was a Protestant. The church said, excuse me, we do have our standards. All right. This is not secularism, Dinesh, and it's quite false to say. And, right. and, and it's actually, there's a, an insinuation in it that I reject and resent. It's All quite right. false to say that this, these are the outcomes of secular politics. Thank you. When I first came to America, well, rather, I went... Wouldn't you say? It's supposed to be a question. <laughs> you notice that in his statement, Christopher Hitchens zoomed in on one issue, Hitler and the Nazis leaving untouched, inf indeed unmentioned, the scourges of communism. Ah, he did not only mention, me hold on, hold on, don't jump in, it's my time. <laughs> me, this is the atheist it. conception of fairness. We hug the public square completely to ourselves and drive all the religions yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> look. You, you wanted you, me, you wanted I, me to I stop. Need, I need about two minutes to answer you. Okay, fine. Not only did he not mention Stalin, not only did he not mention Mao, he didn't mention Pol Pot, Ceausescu, Fidel Castro, Kim Jong-il. Now Richard Dawkins in The God Delusion says, well, there's a big difference. The, the Christians did what they did in the name of religion, but the atheists aren't committing their crimes in the name of atheism. Now, this is what happens when you let a biology major out of the lab. Because here's a guy who, has, who knows nothing of history. I wouldn't accuse you of that, Christopher. But all you have to do is read Marx. All you have to do is familiarize yourself with communism. It was an explicitly atheist ideology that sought to create a new man and a new utopia liberated from the shackles of traditional religion and traditional morality. It was no accident, as the Marxists said, they always targeted the churches, they always killed the clergymen and the priests and so on. Now, the case about Hitler is very interesting. You should read Richard Evans' multi-volume, History of the Third Reich. In the beginning, Hitler thought, I can make some friends among the Lutherans and the Catholics. And so he invented something called positive Christianity, which was basically Nazi Christianity. He praised Christ basically because he said that Christ was the only one alert to the dangers posed by the Jews. But you only have to read the book to realize that Hitler hated Christianity. He hired people around him who were all atheists. Their explicit goal, the moment they got into power, was to destroy the church, which was seen as doing what? Putting a little bit of a moral bridle on the horrible plans of Nazism. 
So ultimately, it's not the Christians. Christians ultimately are accountable in some ultimate sense, atheists or not. And that's why the atheist regimes killed more people in a week than the Inquisition could kill in three centuries. And why? Because of the maxim stated by Dostoevsky and the brothers Karamazov, if God is not, everything is permitted. <clears throat> Uh, again, Ginesh, I'm sorry, a slightly low blow. You, say, you, you said, look, when are you going to get through with your questions? So I politely stopped. And then you said, ha, huh, look at all the things you didn't mention in it, which I was just coming to. Now, I can, um, I can by the way, I can prove that to anyone, and I'm a little sorry to have to point out to you, because you have the proof in your hands. There's a whole chapter of my book on this subject that deals with Stalin and the rest of them. And you know that's true, even if the, if the audience don't. Well, may I, may I This answer? is not a question I'm going to duck. To the contrary, it's why I've insisted on taking up. Would that not be, I appeal to the fairness of the audience, is that not what I've been doing for the last 15 minutes? So don't accuse me of running for a question I'm trying to confront. Now take Russia in 1917, which I think you want me to do. Um, is it not the case that for centuries, hundreds and hundreds of years, millions and millions of Russians have been told that the head of the state is something more than human? Not quite divine, but a little more than human. The head of the church, the Tsar, the little father of his people. And that from him all blessings come. Um, and under this benign Christian rule, serfdom, the publication and circulation of the protocols of the elders of Zion, the original fabrication of anti-Semitism, many other similar delights uh, are born. Um, well, you're Joseph Stalin. You inherit this situation. You're not, you shouldn't be, in the dictatorship business, I submit, wouldn't you agree, if you can't take advantage of a huge reservoir of credulity and servility like that. It's ready-made for you. You can say, well, let's have a heresy hunt, and there will be heretics, all right, and you have a show trial, an inquisition. You can say, let's have miracles. We'll claim we are responsible for miracles. And Lysenko's biology produces, purports to produce miraculous new harvests. We will say that all, all blessings should be attributed to my benign rule. Everyone should thank me all the time and fear the permanent workings of the evil one against the happy state that we're trying to create. This is a simulacrum, very recognizable, of the relationship between Christian orthodoxy, feudalism, serfdom, and anti-Semitism. Now, I will take your challenge, Jeunesse, when you point out to me a society that has degenerated into famine, disease, paranoia, torture, and mass murder because it has followed the precepts of Lucretius and Epicurus and Democritus and Spinoza and Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson and Albert Einstein. If you can do that, if you can point to me a society that erred and fell into horror by doing that, then we'll have a level playing field. So then you know perfectly well we don't have one and you're trying to make it less fair still. Let me, uh, if I may have the same time to answer. Right here we see the way in which something, there's a, a kind of inequality of measurement going on. We find among the atheist writers an attempt to blame religion, not only for its own crimes, but also the crimes of atheism. Sam Harris, in his book, The End of Faith, says the following. He's trying to prove that suicide bombing is entirely religious. But he knows that the inventors of suicide bombing in the modern form are the Tamil Tigers who are fighting over land and are fighting over self-determination. So he says this, while the motivations of the Tamil Tigers are not explicitly religious, they are Hindus who undoubtedly believe many improbable things about the nature of life and death. The cult of martyr worship that they have nurtured for decades has many of the features of religiosity that one would expect in people who give their lives for a cause. So the Tamil Tigers see themselves as secular combatants in a political struggle. But Sam Harris detects a religious motive because these guys are Hindus and surely there's some underlying religious craziness that explains what they're doing. Now we turn to Christopher Hitchens. I want to read, if I may, a line from Daniel Dennett in his book, Breaking the Spell, he says this. 
He says, it is true that religious fanatics are rarely, if ever, guided by the deepest and best tenets in those religions. So what? Al-Qaeda and Hamas terrorism is still Islam's responsibility, and abortion clinic bombing is still Christianity's responsibility. Here's what he's saying. If bad guys do bad things in the name of an ideology, the ideology doesn't get to shake them off and say, those guys were just perversions. You have to take responsibility. And the point I'm making here is, Christopher Hitchens will not take responsibility as an atheist for the crimes committed in the name of atheism. He is doing backward somersaults to blame the Christians for them. So Christianity has a lot to answer for. We wouldn't need repentance if that wasn't the case. But Christians should not have to answer for Mao and Stalin and Hitler, people explicitly dedicated who, if they could, would destroy Christianity and wipe it off the face of the earth, as would apparently Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> it's time to let questioners from the audience get in on the fun. First three questions, King's College students. Do we have a question? Mr. Hitchens, you mentioned that having a simultaneous love and fear of someone is no way to teach morals. Now, I don't know about your upbringing, but how do you propose that we teach any self-respecting, say, two-year-old morals? Two-year-old. Or, or should we wait until they develop a good sense of self-respect for themselves to, to learn morals on their own? I've actually seen the two-year-olds undergoing some of these um, dilemmas. In fact, it's, a, it's an un unbelievably vivid memory. Um, of, it's not nice to think that your children must be evil uh, or innately wicked. Um, but there is a point where reason does enter. It's just a bit, let a bit later than two. Uh, you can't terrify them into doing it. You can sometimes bribe them into doing it by saying Santa Claus knows what they're doing. It has an almost magical effect. But even as you do a thing like that, you feel slightly cheap. In other words, this is going to be a problem for us whether we are people of faith or not. But Christopher, isn't it true that in childhood all learning is based on piety? And by that I mean even if you were to teach somebody the law of gravity as a child, you would teach it to them to be received on faith. Later they would subject it to critical scrutiny. I dare say I'm not going to disagree with you that the observable laws of gravity so why do you are, say not, are not repudiated by any responsible parent, but perhaps, on, I don't know if either of you have noticed this, but you seem to regard, it's a revealing um, disclosure, of the role of religion to treat us as if we were infants. I and, said that uh, when, we, that when we my, are infants. That was my objection to it in the first place. <laughs> I didn't say if we were infants, I said when we are infants. Look, I think there's a deeper point here. The atheists have kind of expected that as countries become more modern, more technological, religion would wither away. They figured out it's not going to happen. And so they've decided to focus on the schools. And so you find common themes in Dawkins' book, Harris' book, Hitchens' book. Why do parents have the right to inculcate religious values in the young? Shouldn't that be something that is taken over by the schools and done, you may say, in an atheist way. Or at least the schools are seen as deprogramming the religious beliefs that parents inculcate into children. I think that this is a little worrisome in a free society. The desire to detach children from the moral training of their parents, to turn it over to experts like Dawkins and Hitchens, whom I think you can see are not merely following the evidence where it leads, but have a certain visceral dislike have themselves an agenda no less fierce than that of any Christian parent. <laughs> this is a question for Mr. D'Souza. Um, it's a statement you made earlier that the laws of nature reflect the goings on in our head. I'd love to hear you elaborate on that a little bit more. The point I was getting at is this. When I said earlier that the laws of nature the universe is lawful. We only have to go to other cultures to see how odd that is. The Muslim writer Al-Ghazali says, how can the universe obey, how can matter obey laws? He says, the universe is a reflection in the mind of Allah. Everything happens because Allah intervenes every single nanosecond to make it happen. Now that's not the belief of Christianity. Now, if you imagine that in our heads are atoms and molecules and neurons firing away, 
I ask you, what logical necessity is there for the, for the workings of these neurons in here to match the laws of the universe out there? Why should there be a correspondence between the two? Again, as a theist, I have an answer. As an atheist, he has a guess. And in fact, he's been hanging an awful lot on that guess tonight. Uh, the reason, I'm not defending this or that miracle, but I'm simply saying that we have a very limited understanding of You haven't defended laws. any miracles, as a matter of fact. I'm sorry? You haven't defended any miracles, as a matter of fact. Well, I, I, in my book, as you know, I defend one, the resurrection. I, I lay out the evidence for it in, in, in a very much, very much in an historical way. But that was my point, that there's a strange correspondence here that. that ultimately relies on faith. And the only difference ultimately with the atheist is he relies on the evidence while denying the metaphysical ground on which it stands. Isn't that true? Metaphysical drama is a bit strong, I think. It's whole cloth fabrication. Isn't science so based on said, metaphysical uh, I assumptions? Still, I still think you misrepresented, David. You, if you see something apparently um, involving suspension of the laws of nature, shall we say the sun standing still so Joshua can win his battle, all right? Or the raising of Jairus' daughter, or uh, even my favorite miracle, the turning of the um, water into wine at Cana. Um, <laughs> A tribute, a tribute to the Hellenistic influence that still persisted in Palestine at that time. Um, you still have to ask yourself the question, which is more probable, that the laws of physics or nature have been suspended, by the way, in my favor, uh, or that I'm under a misapprehension? Everyone has to ask themselves that question. That's if they saw it themselves. If they take it as a report uh, issued through and filtered through dozens of other non-eyewitnesses and corrupt texts down the years, then I would think anyone who says that they think of the resurrection as a historic fact is advertising a willingness to believe in absolutely anything. Let's have another question. This question is for Mr. Christopher, Christopher Hitchens. Um, you've said in past debates, and I refer to the debate between you and Doug Wilson, uh, that morality has merely evolved. And I say merely because I think we'd all agree, Christian and atheist alike, that morality has evolved anthropologically speaking. Um, but I want to know if it's merely evolved, why can't I transcend the current state of evolved morality? What standard, what standard can you appeal to? Well, look, um, evolved morality is because we're an evolved species, and because of our evolution, the, the lowly stamp of which, as Darwin so beautifully puts it, we bear, the fact that we are primates, an unarguable fact. Um, our prefrontal lobes are slightly too small. Um, our adrenal gland, though there's evidence that they're still evolving, which is, I think, heartening. You may have to be patient. Um, it won't come in time for Tom Tancredo, but it is coming. Uh, and our adrenaline glands are too big. They produce more adrenaline than we need. And there are other, all kinds of other problems with our, our whole bearing and, and nature. Some people would like to call this original sin. It's certainly true we have some innate inbuilt design flaws. There isn't going to be any supernatural solution to this. And nor can it be supernaturally commanded to go away. As Fulk Greville says, you can't, make, you can't create people sick and then order them to be well. And that's what religion does. And because it... It's because it makes impossible demands on people and insists they believe in possible things and obey laws that cannot actually be followed that I accuse it of totalitarianism, the essence of which is the combination of authority with caprice. The pro <laughs> Evolution, although a powerful theory in many respects, doesn't account for three things. It doesn't account for the origin of life, which is presumed. It doesn't account for the origin of consciousness, for which Steven Pinker says there is no explanation. It doesn't account for morality. Now, the evolutionists have been trying very hard to do it. And they look at morality as a form of extended selfishness. If a mom jumps in, into a car to save a kid, it's because they share the same genes. That accounts for about 1% of morality. 
But what about the morality that has no genetic benefit? I get up to offer an old lady a seat in a bus. I don't do it because tomorrow I hope I'll get her seat. Or she'll do the same for me. I give blood. Even Richard Dawkins says there's no evolutionary explanation for that. Give me liberty or give me death. The man who helped the Good Samaritan. When we do altruism, or what Christianity calls agape, charity, with no hope of return, there is no evolutionary explanation at all. Now, I want to suggest that this is pointing us to a much deeper truth, and that is this. It is true that we are animals in the sense that we too, like animals and like non-living things, obey the laws of nature. But I want to suggest that the very fact that we have morality, which depends on free will, means that there is a dimension of us that, in, that exists, one may say, transcending the laws of nature. Here's why. A stone doesn't have a choice of whether to roll down the hill. It can't say stop. It merely follows the law. On the other hand, in small decisions and big, I have choice. Here's a pen. I have a free choice to drop it or not. If I drop it, it will follow exactly the laws of gravity. But my decision to drop it is purely a free choice, undetermined by the laws of physics. I can go either way. And every moral choice is of that nature. Our entire vocabulary of thou shalt not and don't do this and you shouldn't have done that would have to be wiped out if it was merely an extent. You wouldn't have to teach anyone right and wrong. It would be genetically programmed into them. So the idea that we are already moral by evolution, it's nonsense. Morality ultimately does have to be inculcated. Next question, please. Yeah, well, I think, I'm sorry, with your, with, with your leave, that demands a, a, a little correction. First, just take the Good Samaritan. Since he was already known of by Jesus of Nazareth, assuming he ever existed, uh, the man from Samaria, he's, his good behavior can't be attributed to Christian teaching, can it, by definition? And if you recall, all the people who behaved worst in that story were priests and Levites and the other devout ones. So they seem to have got their he seems to have got his idea of human solidarity without divine or religious permission. Uh, Christianity did not exist anyone, at the time. Anyone here who isn't a serf can say for themselves, yeah, were you taught, were you taught that it might be a good thing to give blood? Was this inculcated into you? I can certainly say it wasn't into me. When I was a socialist, it was one of the things I was most proud of. I would go to give blood because we were proud of the fact that British National Health Service never had to buy any. There was always enough. There were always enough people who would go and give a pint. Because why not? I'll why, tell you why, what, by the way? They weren't giving one. I give a pint, I don't lose it. I regenerate it quite quickly. But someone gets one. Something in that gesture appeals to me. Christopher, I've done someone a good thing and it hasn't cost me a sacrifice and I don't have to act as if I've just done something incredibly virtuous and self-sacrificial and pious. And then, yes, as a matter of fact, I do have a very rare blood group, and one day I'm going to need some blood myself. And I hope enough other people are thinking about me in their way too. What supernatural or celestial permission is required for this, I ask you. And I will answer. It creates a mystery where none exists. I will answer. In many cultures, people don't give blood. Uh, in many cultures, this idea that you should give a part of yourself for some guy that you don't even know is an old Indian proverb that tears of strangers are only water. The point I'm trying to get at is it seems to me that on a personal level, you're right. No one maybe had to say to you, give blood, give blood, give blood. What you're missing is the fact that here you are, atheist Christopher Hitchens, educated and, and, and raised in a Christian culture, the culture of Christian Europe where this idea of compassion, which was not there in the world before, Aristotle scorned it. Aristotle praised magnanimity, the superior man deigning to the inferior man, but not compassion in the sense of feeling for the other guy. It was Christ who invented that and brought it into the world. Now, you are parasitic on that. You are acting out those virtues, but you're refusing to pay debt or even acknowledge the Christian source of them. That, it seems to me, is a little ungrateful historically. Okay. Let's move, let's move to the next question, and the person asked the question can respond. The other person can then make a response to that, and then we'll try to go right to the next question in order to have 
room for as many as possible. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for showing up tonight. It was you know, a pleasure listening to you at this point. Uh, I have a lot of things I have to say, but of course I want to get succinct on it. Um, a thought I had based on an idea, the, mat uh, the materialization from pre-existence into existence, then concluding with post-existence, one might assert a lack of definitive strength regarding post-existence as the absolute final end. I just want to touch on the notion of what appears to be emerging from non-existence. And, and, and I understand that there's science saying that things have happened, and I'm really not in either one of your corners, I, I feel. But I feel like this is substantial for me. Do you have a question? Yeah, the question is, I'm, I'm trying to generate some feedback, because I think maybe we could humble down and say, hey, well, you know, we are somewhat in the unknown based on linguistics, and, and we're somehow trapped in this sense of the unknown. I mean, you may feel, I know you're science-based, I know you're somewhat religious-based, but this merging out of non-existence into existence and then back into post-existence, do you see a pattern there, a zero, one, zero pattern? And do you and, want Dinesh or Christopher to answer that? And then row four would indicate, if you filled out that pattern, I, I would su suggest a one. Now just tell me what your general idea that is, your sense, your sense of that, not necessarily taking it to verbatim. <laughs> I think we should take that as a statement. I, I move we take that as a statement. That's fine. I don't know if it's on Next. Christian to note, Next. but... Okay, Next. let's move on. Another. Yeah. Um, Dr. Hitson, I come from Tonga. No, Professor in the South Hitson, Pacific. please. please. Uh, Professor, um, before Christianity came, Tonga, Fiji, um, Fiji, they have men for dinner, and in Tonga, the, it was a mess. My question is, let's say they did not come to the Pacific, what, is your, what do you have to offer us as an atheist? What do you have to offer us? Um, well, it's a bit, uh, should I ventriloquize the question? I'm not sure everybody heard it. The gentleman is from the island of Tonga, which is in the Pacific. It uh, used to be a British crown possession. I don't know if it still is. I'm certain that's how the Christians got there anyway. Uh, <laughs> thanks to British imperialism. And <clears throat> he says that um, before the Christians came, um, people were freely dining off one another. This is a fair... In Fiji, yeah. Um, I've, heard the, I've heard the stories. Um, it's, often, you know, it's often struck me as a, a tremendous problem. Why was no redemption ever sent to this island? Why did it go on? I, it, it reminds me of the question I, just, I, I closed by in my original statement. 98,000 years of human existence and heaven watches with indifference. We're expected to believe 2,000 years ago intervenes by means of a human sacrifice in which all took part and which all must believe and that's the salvation. And it doesn't, it doesn't, this is not offered to the Chinese who at that stage can read and can write and can build boats and can have libraries and gunpowder and can spread an idea. No, no. It takes many thousands of years before in a very weird form it gets to China at all. There are parts of Borneo where people still practice cannibalism where this message still hasn't spread. Now, this isn't a problem for me because I regard it as man-made. As, well, I, it isn't a problem for me. This is my answer because I regard it as man-made. The, the answer for you must be, unless you accuse humanism or secularism of advocating cannibalism, which it does not, um, is how come this design, this revelation, this redemption, this faith-based, and I should re remind you earlier that my, my identification of the problem was precisely faith, the preference of that over reason and evidence. Why doesn't it seem to work? Why, whenever you ask, why is there so much suffering, misery, ignorance, backwardness, and barbarism, why is that question unanswerable in the terms in which it's asked? You've just phrased it for Tonga and Fiji. I think, you're, I think Christopher is missing the force of the argument here, which is not simply that the Christians have been negligent in carrying this universal message, but that when Christianity came to the rest of the world, it brought new values into those cultures. One time I um, said to my grandfather, how come we are part of a tiny Christian minority in India? And he said, uh, two words the Portuguese Inquisition, meaning that some very zealous missionaries, possibly accompanied with some bayonets, came to India and Christianized the Indians. 
want to say two things about this, however. Even though that may have occurred at the beginning, you found in a very short time large numbers of Indians rushing to Christianity, and why? As I looked into this matter as I got a little bit older, I discovered that in the Indian caste system, you have four castes with the untouchables at the bottom, and if you're born an untouchable, you're finished. There's nowhere to go. You can't get out of it. Many of the people in the untouchable class were very attracted to Christianity because they saw it as affirming the idea of spiritual equality among persons. This was not immediately or even over a long time translated into complete political or social equality, but it meant something to say to somebody, you're not a nothing, you're not a dog, you are a human being and that alone counts for a lot. What I'm trying to say, and I think what the gentleman here was trying to say, is that most of the world didn't have that. We didn't have it in Western civilization either. Christianity brought it in. Now, it imported some of it from Judaism. But Judaism was for the tribe. God instructs his chosen people. Christianity takes the idea and universalizes it. If you look at the rights that are stated in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, you notice something very interesting. You read those rights, they're universal rights? No. Virtually all of those rights are the specific legacy of Christianity. It's good that they're universalized because Christianity wanted from the beginning to universalize them. But they are not the shared rights recognized in all the cultures and practices, whether religious or non-religious in other cultures. So I think we're seeing here from people who have experienced it. I don't care about those inquisitors who came a long time ago. I'm kind of grateful to them, although probably my ancestors would not have shared my enthusiasm. But they brought me into the orbit of Christianity and Western civilization and the fact that I have the values that I do, the beliefs that I do, the respect for dignity, women, equality, and so on, is entirely the legacy of Christianity as it came, as it was exported. I'm sorry to say, Christopher, not by the British, but by the Portuguese. The British could have done a better job. <laughs> Next question, please. The thing is, just a tiny thing, if you <laughs> claim it, if you claim it for one, you have to claim it for all, it seems to me. It means that that means you accept that, yes, Hamas does a lot of good with social services. Yes, Louis Farrakhan gets black kids off drugs. Yes, the Mormons must have had a, a point devout as they were when they said black people didn't have souls, as they did until the 1970s. That, that everything attributable to religion uh, must, be, must be attributable to it. You can't just pick and choose the bits that you like. The abolition of cannibalism is one thing. The Muslims say they, they abolished uh, child sacrifice, but think of the things they also brought. And, and tell me if this doesn't show what I've been arguing from the first, that it is a man-made institution, not a divinely appointed one, and that you get exactly the sort of coincidences you would expect from that. The world looks as it would look if there was no God. Next question, please. Um, my question is for Mr. Hitchings. Um, sorry, keep getting them, but... Oh, that's um, right. <laughs> um, movement, evolution, and change are hallmarks of human history. If religion poisons everything, as you claim, why haven't we just gotten rid of it and moved on? Well, I think that there are two reasons. I'll, I'll be quick, because um, I should see when you ask. Uh, religion caters to uh, our egocentricity to our sense of self-importance, um, as well as to our um, masochistic tendencies. I'll say what I mean by that. It's, religion teaches us that we are originally sinful, that we're sinners in the hands of an angry God, the Quran says we're made out of a clot of blood, the Bible says out of dust, that we, we, we're born evil, we're wicked, uh, we should sprawl, we should grovel, we should be glad that someone who even cares to look after us at all, we'll be grateful. I think this is a disgusting attitude, but uh, you won't, I think, fail to recognize that it's uh, a very accurate picture of what's preached. But, worm as you are, cheer up. The universe is designed with you in mind, and God has a plan for you, and you alone. So to this terrible groveling is added a terrific arrogance as well. Thus you get the phenomenon of people like Mother Teresa say, rushing past you, pushing you off the pavement, saying, sorry, sorry, out of my way, don't mind me, I'm just on errand for God. And they call this modesty. That's why it appeals. And the second reason why it appeals is, I don't know why this is, because I don't see what there is to fear in it, 
You're not going to know when you're dead. You're not going to know it. So there's nothing to be frightened of. But people are frightened of death. And the central lie of all religion is that there's a cure for this. And an exception will be made in your own case. An eternal life offered if you make the right propitiations and the right uh, abjections. Well, I'm sorry. I think that's the height of immorality to lie to people like that. That's, but that's why it survives. That's why it survives. Let me answer, if I may. Um, religion poisons everything. Christopher is known for literary flair. I think what we've seen here today, when I first came to America, I lived in Arizona, I went to a rodeo, and I'm sort of reminded of that. We, we have a point here, a point there, and just a lot of bull in between. Uh, now, here's what I mean by that. Isn't it, isn't it a case of gross uh, rhetorical and argumentative excess? I mean, did religion poison Shakespeare? Or Milton? Or Dante? Or Michelangelo? Or Raphael? Or Bach? Were they corrupted by religion? No. Their work is in some ways a, an exhibition of a transcendent reflection as we see in art. Even secular people should be able to appreciate that and to recognize that that is the special legacy of our civilization built in part on Greece but also in equal if not larger part on Jerusalem. Now, the, we are now coming closer to the core of what this debate is about. This idea here that religion is a form of wish fulfillment. Christopher didn't think of that. Sigmund Freud said it. Marx said it in a different way. Religion is the opium of the people. We can't face life. We can't face death. So we make up stuff. Now, I don't want to give a, I could give a religious rebuttal to that, which would look something like this. I can totally see why in a wish fulfillment world, we would invent heaven. Heaven is cool. And if I wanted to get away from my diabetes or the fact of death, I might say, I'd like to live in heaven. I don't think I would have made up hell. Hell is more severe than diabetes. <laughs> it's, it's a little tougher than death. So why would a wish, wish fulfillment inventors of religion come up with the rules of self-denial and so on that make our life more difficult, more sacrificial. We would make it easy. We'd start by taking out that commandment against adultery. If we were making it all up. Now, one for final point. The idea of religion as wish fulfillment makes no evolutionary sense at all. A point made by the atheist Steven Pinker. He says this. It, is, it makes no evolutionary sense to make stuff up that threatens your own survival. Imagine this, I am a rabbit. I am being pursued by a lion. I have to decide whether to run. I decide I will not run. Why? There is another life waiting for me, even better than this one. What would be the fate of such a rabbit? It would be immediately eaten. Rabbits who engaged in wish fulfillment would not survive. That's the point. You need a better theory. <laughs> It's, it's nine o'clock, and normally we would move to concluding statements by our two debaters, but both of them before the debate told me they would waive those last statements in order to allow another question or two. So let's have another one. Mr. Hitchens, uh, you began your opening statement by decrying the very concept of faith or beliefs in the absence of good, solid, supportable evidence. Um, uh, there was an American psychologist named William James who was a great believer in faith um, and he insisted that the wonderful contribution of Christianity was to allow us to make leaps of faith that the laws of science or even mere common sense would decry as completely unsupportable. Um, it's uh, unlike a, um, a man of faith, can a completely rational mind have the courage to, for instance, take a leap of faith with a total stranger that could lead to friendship? or maybe even with a dire enemy um, in the hope that that might ultimately lead to peace? Well, I think you're confusing the, the leap of faith with a, with a risk or a chance. The, uh, the leap of faith, which I attribute to Kierkegaard, not to uh, the varieties of religious experience, is, is the, the ne what's necessary to get you across a gap where no evidence exists. Um, and where some of the evidence may be to the contrary. The pro and the problem with that, though I can see the, the will behind it, is that you can't make it just once. 
and find yourself on the other side. Faith got me across this chasm. Now I'm safe. You have to keep on making it. You have to keep on going to church, sometimes several times a week, to assure yourself you are right to believe it in the first place. And it becomes morbid and ritualistic and irrational. And you're back where you started, on the wrong side of the chasm. Otherwise, this argument, <laughs> we wouldn't be having this argument if Christianity had an answer to any of this, or any other religion either. In, in Christopher's book, he makes the argument, I think I've seen him quoted saying this too, that the absence of evidence is evidence of absence. If you don't see evidence for something, don't believe it. Now, I would suggest that in the empirical domain, in the world of human experience, that is a valid principle. It even applies to miracles. If someone came to me and said, my leg grew three feet last week, I would say, let's bring in the doctor with the measuring stick. Let's see if it actually happened. We are in the domain of verification. However, the non sequitur here is the following. There are many questions that are vital to our life because it would affect the way we live that are not in the empirical domain. Let's say I would ask you, is there life after death? Shakespeare says death is the undiscovered country. No one who's gone there has ever come back. And it's certainly not in a natural. So here's the question. How would you subject that proposition to testing? What possible evidence are you looking for when it is not in the empirical domain? Christopher says automatically reject it out of hand. Since there is no evidence, but there is no evidence in a domain where evidence is unavailable. So I would suggest that here we have the dogmatic atheism that because it doesn't know, refuses to believe. Now if you ask me, do I know? I would say, no, on this point I don't know either. The believer shares the agnosticism with the atheist, but the difference is the believer says, even though I don't know, I believe. Remember, the statement of belief is not a statement of knowledge. I know my brother. I wouldn't say I believe in my brother, I know the guy. The reason I say I believe is because I don't know. So what I'm saying is, why is it in any way more irrational for me to take a position on one side of an issue than for him to take the other side of the issue on which there is no empirical evidence on either side? I would submit it's a leap of faith for both of us. The only difference is I am leaping toward God, he's leaping against him. Yes, last question please. Thank you both. Uh, my question is for Christopher. Um, I've heard you say in several debates that I've seen online that you do not deny the existence of either the transcendent or the numinous. And that's the language that you use. Yes. And uh, I was just thinking, given your obvious antipathy to towards uh, religious belief and superstition, I think a lot of people come to religion and come to religious belief after having some sort of peak experience, some, either a transcendent experience, an experience of the numinous. So I was, my question is, um, how would you advise someone or what, what, what sort of recommendation would you make for someone that has that sort of experience but doesn't want to interpret that in, let's say, a, a religious vein? Because I think many people will turn to religion because they're so just profoundly disoriented after having like some sort of experience of transcendence. Okay, well, um, what I say, I, I very much as you noticed it, is that the transcendent and the numinous, which I wouldn't trust anyone who didn't have as faculties, or faculties which should be distinguished from the supernatural. That, for example, um, I'm just about to forget his last name. Francis is his first name. He's the Collins, Collins of the Human Genome Project, who I, with whom I had a long discussion the other night. Says that he was hiking one day. In, I think it was in the Pacific Northwest. And there was a frozen waterfall that had three streams frozen. It was a frozen trinity, if you like. And at that moment, he says, he got down on his knees and accepted Jesus Christ. Now, I will simply have to say, of someone whose work I enormously respect, and who I believe I've quoted correctly, that that to me is a wild non sequitur. That people who talk like that are, it may be a deformity in me, I think it's white noise to talk like that. White noise. Um, and I don't think I'm missing anything, because I'm quite just as fond of the music of Verdi, say, as I was when I thought he was a Christian, presumably was, as when I found out that he wasn't. And many other great famous musicians and painters who actually turn out to, in their devotional efforts, not to have been themselves devoted. 
And that's why I don't think, I'm going to take a bit of my answer to reply to, to Dinesh just now on this point of whether, it's, uh, whether these things apply to both of us. No, they don't. When I say I think that that's a meaningless statement, um, I'm not making a meaningless statement myself. Anyone can say that they understood what I said about Francis Collins' remark. Uh, by the same token, when I had a debate on Hugh Hewitt's program, a very fair-minded, very intelligent Christian, he got me on with his favorite Presbyterian. He said, this is the man you have to beat. And I said, all right, we went at it. One of the questions I asked him was about the resurrection. Do you agree with the verse in St. Matthew that says that at the time of the crucifixion, all the graveyards of Jerusalem opened and the dead came out and walked and greeted their old friends and so forth? And I was going on to ask him, because if you do, it seems to me to cheapen the idea of resurrection if it was so commonplace. That's where I was going with it. But he, he thought I was asking whether literally true or not. And he said, well, as a Christian, yes, I absolutely do believe it. But I'm not so sure I believe it as a historian. I will just have to say that to me, that nonsensical remark is a statement of faith. And what I've just said about its, non its nonsensical character is not itself a meaningless remark, because it's intelligible to everybody here. And that should weigh a little in this argument, it seems to me. Thank you. Well. I don't know what Francis Collins was getting at, but I, I can tell you a little bit about what Kepler was getting at. I think when you look at nature, you notice that there is enormous intelligence embodied in nature. And this is, I think, for the person who thinks about it, a deep mystery. Kepler uh, was measuring the movements of the planets, and the theologians all told him that the planets should move in circles. And uh, Kepler realized that was not the case. But he said, I bet you, based on faith, that there is a divine plan for the motions of the planets that is far more ingenious, mathematical, symmetrical, and beautiful than anything you have thought of so far. And when he revealed Kepler's laws, he said, I found it. This is, if you will, God's plan for the universe. There's a deeper point we're getting at here. Earlier, Christopher said, what does Christianity do that's different? Why can't an atheist do the same? He's written a book uh, denouncing uh, Mother Teresa, um, somewhat irreverently called The Missionary Position. I do want to tell you a, uh, I do want to tell you a, a very brief, I want to tell you a very brief story about this and, and try to say why someone like Mother Teresa might be an object of such derision. Uh, Mother Teresa was in Calcutta, apparently hugging a leper, at which point an Indian walking by casually said to her, I wouldn't do that for all the money in the world. And she replied, I wouldn't either. I am doing it for the love of Christ. Oh, please. And, oh. and the point I'm trying to get at here is, Yuck. I can see him champing at the bit, and, I, and I, before, before I turn it over to you, I want to give an explanation for why he's champing at the bit. Religion makes moral demands on us, and Christianity asks that we move outside of ourselves and consider first the welfare of the other person. Now, this is ultimately a little bit of an annoying and an irritating and a difficult doctrine. Even Augustine prayed, make me chaste, O Lord, but not yet. The Christian feels this too. The atheist, I want to suggest, is chafing under the moral rules of Christianity. That's the concentration camp he's talking about. Ultimately, he realizes that a life lived according to the Ten Commandments is a life in which we are accountable. We all live in a world where bad guys sometimes make off with the money, where good guys come to grief. It's not fair. What goes around doesn't come around. But religion says that at the end of the day, what goes around does come around. There is a last judgment, there is an ultimate accountability. I would suggest that as human beings we chafe under that. We hate the idea that our actions are ultimately accountable, that even the things that we do in private and in the dark are under scrutiny and are being recorded. Atheism is a massive rebellion against that, but it disguises itself as moving along the strict pathways of reason. It's not an intellectual revolt, it's a moral revolt.
could we have been we've been going at this for over 90 minutes now and it's time to sadly cut it off three concluding notes first if you have information cards for King's College or love notes for Christopher or Dinesh uh, please give them to an usher as you're leaving secondly Dinesh here will be signing copies of his new book and third thank all of you for coming and Please join me in thanking our two debaters.